Thank you to Barbie for reading the scripture today. Today we are in Matthew chapter 22 verses 1 to 14 and the title of the sermon is, Are You Coming? Back in the days when I was a campus minister at USC, there came a time that uh, somebody managed to get all the campus ministers' names on an invitation list to be a part of the president's party during football games. So at least once a football season, I would get an invitation for me and my spouse to come to be a part of the president's party at a particular football game. And uh, I don't care much for football, but um, if the president of the university invites me, then ah, I'll go. And so this would be like you had to show up at a certain time and there was a meal and you sat at the, at the table oftentimes with, the, I mean the kind of people that got, in, got invited to this were upper level administrators of the university, trustees, and donors to the university. So how in the world we got on this list? I have no idea, but we did. Now, some years it would only be one or two campus ministers would be, be invited per game. And so uh, it would just be me and Rod, and then there would be uh, maybe another campus minister who would be sitting at some other table. And there we were, sitting there at the table with trustees and vice presidents and you know and these people would be fairly significant people in the community and I we would sit there kind of going um, well we don't really have anything to say to these people <laughs> it's really hard to have conversations with them they're talking at a whole different social level than we are it was kind of strange but it was an interesting thing and it was quite uh, an exciting thing you go to a meal and then you would go be bussed over to the Coliseum and you would sit along the 50 yard wet line about you know a third of the way up in the stands and um, enjoy time and then there would be an after party. It would be a whole day thing. And there was a dress code. They told you in the invitation how to dress for this. Like I say, I really don't care much about football but if the president of the university invited me, I would come. Now, it was weird and awkward sitting at the table with these trustees and everybody, and I'm sure they're thinking, who invited them, you know, these campus ministers? Uh, one year, I think they just decided, oh well, somehow we have to ca invite all these campus ministers, they're on the list, let's just invite them all to the same game and we'll put them all at the same table together. That was a good year, that was a lot of fun. But again, if the president of the university invites you, you come and you dress appropriately, right? So as we look at this parable, this is the third parable, the third parable after the question that the, the religious leaders and the Pharisees and the rulers, these folks, high level people in, in the religious life, in the community life, of Israel when they ask Jesus the question who gave you the authority to do what you're doing probably the most offensive thing that Jesus did although I'm sure that that question uh, included a lot of Jesus's activities but the most uh, the, the most uh, grievous thing that Jesus did was he went into the temple and all the money changers and people who were selling sacrifices and everything and he just went in and he turned over the tables and he and he told all of these people to go and he caused this great commotion in the temple and so after that he's confronted by the religious leaders who ask by whose authority are you doing this and Jesus even brings up John the Baptist and he becomes part of the conversation as well 
John the Baptist, who was martyred. And so we have this parable. The kingdom of God is like a king throwing a wedding banquet when his son is getting married. And this king throws a wedding banquet and he invites all the people that you would expect to be invited. All the upper level, elite, powerful, influential people in town. Those are the ones who get invited to this, to this party, this wedding banquet. It's kind of like the last royal wedding that um, most of us only saw because we watched it on TV, and that is that wedding between Prince Harry and Meghan, and you know all of the important people that came to that, and you had special invitations and uh, famous and and powerful people who came to the royal wedding. You know, if you get an invitation from the queen to come to a royal wedding, you come, right? The funny thing is, though, in this story, the king invites all of the people that you would expect to be invited to this wedding, and they decide they don't want to come. Now, we don't know why they don't want to come, except they say, no, we're not coming. Some of them were blatant. Well, we're not coming. Others were a little more subtle. You know, I really got to go. I got to work that day. Or um, I've, I've got to go out to my farm because I've got stuff going on out there. It's, uh, you know, harvest time and it's just too busy. I just can't make it. And then there were others that were um, awful because they mistreated and even killed the messengers the servants that came to bring the invitation to them. When the king invites you to a wedding banquet, who says no? I mean, really, who says no? And for that matter, who kills the messenger? I mean, this is incredible. And I would imagine people listening to the story would go, are you kidding? Who would do that? But Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like this wedding banquet where people are invited. All the people that you expect to go to this wedding banquet, all the people that you would expect to be God's people, religious leaders and um, important people in the community, that they would be invited to this wedding and that they would go. But Jesus is saying in this story, they say no. Who would do that? God, Jesus tells in the story that the king acts like a king when the king is refused by these people. And ultimately, when, when his messengers, when his servants are abused and killed, and it says he, he goes in and he just destroys their, their city. Now for Matthew, who is writing this, to his particular audience, this has a particular uh, meaning at this point. Because at the time that Matthew is writing about this event, this story that Jesus is telling the religious leaders, at the time he's writing this, it is most likely following the destruction of the temple, where Rome came in and destroyed the temple. As this audience is listening to what Jesus has to say in this parable, and they hear that the king gets upset and destroys the city, they have in their mind what happened, what actually happened in Jerusalem to the temple sometime not long before this story is being told. And so, it brings out this idea that these religious leaders who decided they didn't want to be a part of this renewal, this, this incredible movement that was going on when Jesus came, when these religious leaders and rulers made this deal with Rome, with all of the compromises 
that happened that squelched these new movements, but particularly the movement where Jesus the Messiah is in their midst, and they, they squelch the movement, and they try and stop what's going on. In the end, they couldn't prevent what was going to happen, and that was the destruction of the temple by Rome. Even all of their deals and compromises in the end couldn't stop it. They sold their souls for what? And so we see in this first part of the story people who are invited, the expected people to attend such an occasion were invited and they said no. And they suffered dire consequences as a result. But then the story goes on and the king says to his servants, go out and invite everybody else. I don't care who they are, invite them to the wedding. And he actually goes after them and seeks them out. Go to every corner of, of the kingdom and invite them to the wedding. And so all of these people, regular, ordinary people who don't get invited to king's wedding banquets, to big events like this, ordinary people, they come to the wedding banquet. And not just the ordinary people, but even, even the riffraff, the sinners, all of those people, tax collectors, prostitutes, um, all of those kinds of people that everybody considers sinners and lost and have nothing to do with religion and all of that, even they are invited and they come. The unexpected are invited into the, king, the, the party. And I imagine as these religious leaders, these rulers hear this story, they're shocked. What? They come to the party? They get invited to the party? There may even be an attitude of, well, I wouldn't want to be at a party with them anyway. Because, you know, they were always questioning the company that Jesus kept. How come you hang out with those kind of people? This is like the kingdom of God. Whoever wants to come can come. It reminds me of something that Dallas Willard said one time. He said, God will let anyone into heaven who can stand it. The kingdom of God is a present and a future reality. It's a place that Jesus makes available to us. It is a place and a reality where God is accessible to us, that we can commune with God. It is a place where everything is how God wants it. It's whenever we see things like peace and justice and goodness and kindness, whenever we see these kinds of things, we can see evidence of the kingdom of God. When we see things that are big miracles and little bit miracles, people who are forgiven and people who are reconciled, this is all evidence of the kingdom of God. It's a present reality that we can tap into, that we can experience, that we can see and get glimpses of. But it's a future reality because we know as we enter into the kingdom of God, as we experience it now, that there will be a day that that will be the full reality of our lives, that we will be able to experience the kingdom of God in its fullness. And so we're all invited to this wedding banquet. Are you coming? We're all invited to be a part of the kingdom of God, no matter who we are, regular, ordinary, normal, non-distinct kind of folk, or even riffraff, we're all invited to be a part of the kingdom of God. But the parable doesn't end there. I kind of wish it did. It's easier to preach if it ends there but it doesn't. 
it keeps going. So the king comes to the wedding celebration, to the banquet, and he starts walking around and noticing all the people that have come to the wedding banquet. And he comes upon this one guy who doesn't dress appropriately. It says he didn't wear his wedding robe. He didn't wear what he was supposed to wear. And this was in some way, I don't know, offensive. It was some way that this person was not taking this celebration seriously. He was out of place because he wasn't dressed appropriately. And at first the king says, friend, what's this? Why aren't you wearing your wedding robe? And the guy had no answer. He had no answer for him. And so we see that the king then acts like a king and says, get this guy out of here. And so they take him and they throw him out. He was not taking part in the celebration, in the wedding celebration. Somehow he found himself there, but he was not participating. He wasn't taking part. When we don't take part in the kingdom of God, when we don't seek and strive for the kingdom of God in our lives, uh, we're missing out. We're missing something valuable and meaningful and everlasting in our lives. So the question for us is, how do we dress for the kingdom of God? Is there really something we should wear? Now Paul talks about this in the book of Colossians. In Colossians 3, Paul says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgive, forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. What's being described there is a transformation that continues to take place in our lives. The more that we strive to be a part of the kingdom of God, the more that the kingdom of God becomes a reality that we experience on a regular basis in our lives, the more we seek to have God at work in our lives. We begin to put on these things that are a part of the character of the kingdom of God. We dress appropriately for the kingdom of God. And it's an ongoing price process. So the question is, are you coming? Are you going to accept that invitation that Jesus has given to all of us? That invitation to be a part of the kingdom of God? To experience the kingdom of God in our lives every single day? Are we going to accept the invitation when we wake up in the morning? Are we accepting the invitation for the rest of our lives and into eternity to be a part of the kingdom of God? Are, we, are you coming? Are you excited about the people that are going to be there with us? Are we excited about the other people who are coming to the wedding? Do we appreciate the people that we have the opportunity to be at this party with, to be a part of the kingdom of God? Do we work to build the relationships with each other and to forgive one another and be re reconciled to one another? And all of those things that make us community in the kingdom of God. And then finally, are, are we going to dress appropriately? We're going to put on the things, the character that is a part of the kingdom of God. We're going to put on Christ. 
so that all can see? Are we going to dress appropriately as a part of the kingdom of God? So what do you say? Are you coming? <laughs>